Hello everyone and welcome to today's broadcast. I'm Jim Staley, Passion for Truth Ministries, and today we're going to talk about the most important commandment, I believe, in the entire Bible, but it's the least obeyed, right after this. Again, everybody, I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries, and I'm excited about this week's program because it's so practical. This message is extraordinarily important. It's at the very top of the list of the Creator for us as far as what we're supposed to be doing. Our focus and intent is supposed to be on growing the kingdom, and how do we do that? So this week's message is going to be focused around keeping the most important commandment that you could probably ever keep as it relates to growing the kingdom of God. And what is it? Sharing the gospel of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah. In Hebrew, you'll hear me say that if you're new to this channel, Yeshua, that is his Hebrew name and it means salvation. And so when we're talking about the name Yeshua, you can't get any more connected to its original root form than to talk about salvation with someone that doesn't have that salvation built into their system, into their heart yet. And that's what we're going to do. I've led hundreds of people to Christ throughout my life. I have had about every scenario that you can imagine. And so I've discovered that in my uh, ministry, my time in ministry, most people are scared to death of sharing their faith with someone else. They just don't like public speaking to begin with, much less any kind of remote confrontation at all. I'm going to make it easy for you. And so in today's broadcast, we're going to break it down. We're going to make it easy. It's going to be built into two sections. First section is going to be what do you need to know before you share the gospel? And then the second half of this is going to be, this video is going to be actual step-by-step of how you do it, complete with the scriptures uh, to share, analogies to share, and some tips. And then at the very end, I'm going to show you in a second part how I train my kids to lead me to Christ. And so we had a competition in my house for several weeks. I was training my kids on how to share the gospel. And we ended up with a playoffs and the World Series of sharing the gospel with dad for as a competition for gift certificates to Chick-fil-A and to Smoothie King. And so you're going to get to see that. How many times do I get saved? I'll be curious uh, what you guys think and who you think got first place uh, in that. And that'll be at the very end. So stick around for the very end. But before we begin, I want to just let you know, some of you that are so used to the depth of, of what we talk about here and diving into the original scriptures and the Tanakh and the Hebrew and all the original languages, today is just the gospel. And I'm telling you, from the very beginning, no matter how far my journey has come of coming into the Christian roots of my faith, there's one thing that has never changed, and that is the definition of the gospel. That is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and that remains the same. So for some of you, this is going to seem a very simple message. That's because the gospel is that simple. So don't expect it to be complex. You don't start off with how all the different things that you need to do as a believer and the, you know, keeping other commandments and doing this and obeying God. Like the first thing that people need to understand is the gospel. And it's very simple. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to equip you today of how to share your faith. All right. Are you ready? Let's go. Number one rule in life when it comes to sharing the gospel is whether you want to or not, you are always sharing God. Now, I didn't say the gospel. I said God. You are always sharing God. The question is, what kind of God are you sharing? Are you sharing the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that loves at such a no return that he sent his only begotten son that had compassion and empathy uh, when 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 people didn't get it, he wasn't uh, he he didn't he didn't demean them or make fun of them. Now maybe the Pharisees that kind of deserve some of that chiding, they're judged more strictly. But for the rest of the common folk, God just Yeshua just Jesus wrapped his arms around them, and uh, and and that's the God that we serve. So we have to live our lives in such a way that when we sharing God, we're actually sharing the gospel. And I just want to submit to you that there's a lot of you out there today. In, in Christendom that are sharing God, but you're not sharing the God of the Bible. You're definitely not sharing the good news. And if and you're you're creating an image of God that, that doesn't exist. And quite frankly, Moses did that one time when he hit the, the rock twice. And that image not only didn't exist, God was upset that the image 
that he portrayed was not of him and he kept them from coming into the promised land. And so we want to make sure that we stay on the, in the favor of God by always projecting the image of God. All right. So first and foremost, we are always sharing God, but we're not always sharing the gospel. And that's where we want to get to. Number two, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, read it with me. This is the great commission right here. Some of you haven't read this in years. Let's go back to it right now. And it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things which I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. And so right here, we've got a command. We've got to go out and we've got to not just make converts, but we've got to make disciples. We've got to share our faith. We've got to share what we believe. Why? Because the the entire original intent of God was for his kingdom to be uh, executed on earth, his kingdom to grow. It's to increase the kingdom. It's to bring the kingdom here. And how do we do that? We do that through the good news. We do that by sharing the light that's inside of us, which brings me to another really good point. Uh, there is absolutely no better witness than just to be in love with, with Yeshua. Now, if this is one of your first broadcasts, you're going to hear me say Yeshua um, and lo- along with the si- side of the word Jesus, because Yeshua is the original Hebrew name of Christ. That's what his mama called him. That's what his, his dad called him, uh, was Yeshua, which in Hebrew means salvation. Go figure. Incredible. Jesus is the transliteration of Yeshua, but I like to go back to the original Hebrew and, and, and do Bible things in Bible ways and call Bible names, uh, Bible things by Bible names, if you will. So, uh, any case, there's no better witness than to absolutely be in love with, with Christ. When you are in love with Christ, it will flow out of you. You can't, you're always thinking about Him. Like, remember when you were in love, right? If you've ever been in love, that's all you think about night and day is being with that other person, talking with that other person, right? And and, and communicating and just being in that intimate moment, uh, learning more about that person. That's what we should be like with Christ. When we are in love with Him, that's all we want to do is be about His business. Everywhere we go, we're looking through life through that lens. As a matter of fact, last Uh, This week, uh, I've been camping, kind of getting my camper ready for Sukkot this fall for the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're camping in a local campground, and and, uh, about the time that we got everything set up, and and me and my wife are just sitting down next to a a, a bonfire, it was wonderful, it was about, I don't know, 7 or 8 o'clock at night, here comes this this, uh, old uh, beat-up camper that gets put into this spot, and uh, hours and hours go by, and about 10.30 at night, he's making a fire. Now, I've been to prison. I know what it's like, and I know what drug dealers look like pretty much, and I could tell right away these were drug addicts. Without a doubt, I've seen it uh, so many times that the chances were very high. And so we were sitting on this side of the fire, looking across the fire at him making a fire at 1030 night, and I noticed he didn't have any firewood. And immediately, I just started praying out loud. Uh, Father God, I just ask that you give us an opportunity to witness to these to this couple. And uh, and Cheryl said, you ought to go over there and witness. And I said, you know what? I wonder if he has any firewood. I, it doesn't look like he does. So I decided to start the conversation by sharing my faith through action, through filling a need. It's important. It's one of the best ways to share is relationship sharing. I wanted to create a relationship, and I saw a need. He was pulling wood out of the of the woods and I had firewood in my truck. So I just brought him over some firewood and just started up a conversation. And, uh, and then his fiance came out. She came over and met my wife. And I was talking to him and she was talking to her. Well, hours went by. And lo and behold, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they were sitting at my picnic table right underneath my awning of my camper. And they came to Christ. They gave their life to Christ in absolutely incredible fashion. It was beautiful and we had an opportunity to pray with them and cry with them and heal some of the hurts from traumas in their past. 
It was a beautiful experience. And they're going to be there uh, for the next couple of weeks. And we're going to be, we ordered them some Bibles. We're going to be taking care of them and ministering to them, showing them how to have Bible study. Uh, for all intents and purposes, they are homeless, but they've got a plan. We're going to try to help them out. All that to say, that moment, that story is what initiated this conversation right now that we're having. This is what life is all about, ladies and gentlemen. We could have sat there at our fire and enjoyed one another. The last thing we really wanted to do is be interrupted as husband and wife, and we never get hardly any time together. But here, we just couldn't help ourselves. We needed to share the gospel with this couple. And, uh, and praise God that we did. God blessed that moment. And, uh, and you can pray for them. One of the most important things that everyone needs to know about sharing the gospel is this. You got to have a burden for the lost. If you don't have a burden for the lost and you don't care about whether someone's going to hell or whether somebody's going to heaven, then you need to check your heart and ask God to give you a burden for the lost. That compassion, that empathy, it will bleed over into every part of your life. Having a care and concern about the lost is the number one requirement for you to be able to share with the lost outside of being saved yourself is caring about them. Be friendly, right? Put off a vibe of love. There's so many people that are banging their Bibles, you know, the street witnessing, and and look, sometimes it works. But people like to be treated the way that we like to be treated. Like, people want to be treated the way you want to be treated. And I don't like people yelling at me. I don't like people forcing their faith on me. If, If someone comes up, a Mormon, and they want to share their faith, uh, be a big mistake if they did, because they they uh, I think I'm blacklisted on their list. They don't come to my door anymore. But I always invite them in. But if I don't want to talk, I want them to respect my wishes, right? In the same way, we need to be respectful, but we also need to be very friendly and let that vibe of Christ start the conversation right there. Number three, use your own testimony. The Bible says that you'll be known by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. So have the power of the blood of the Lamb behind you, but then you got to have a testimony. And what does that mean? What, what is your testimony? I encourage you to, to write out your testimony if you're not familiar uh, with how to give the gospel and you've never given your testimony to somebody. Tell them what, you look, what, what life looked like for you before you got saved and then why you got saved. Show them how, how did you get saved and then what God has done in your life since then. How are you different? That's your testimony is going from death until life, that's what you want to share. Know your testimony and be ready to give it. Number four, find common ground and use analogies that will be familiar to them. This is really important and quite frankly, it is the, it's the capstone of how I share. I really take it serious when Christ used parables, he used agricultural ideas to share uh, his concepts. Why did he use agricultural ideas. Why did he use seed and wheat? Why did he use water and farming and fig trees, right? Why did he use sheep and cattle? Because this was what the society was used to. He's speaking their language. He's taking things that they're very familiar with, and then he's putting his own spiritual spin on it to make the light bulb go off. He created man, so he knows that man responds very well to uh, to pictures, to word pictures, and to what they're already doing with their hands in the dirt. And so what I like to do is look for something that someone's already doing and then make the connection in the spiritual realm. Because people that are so familiar, let's say, with working on a car... Using a car analogy, having some analogies in your back pocket and being creative on the fly, you can sometimes really make the light bulb go on. For instance, sir, if you are a, a mechanic, you can say you could say something like this, sir, you're a mechanic and and the engine of the car is the most important, right? But what good is the engine without any fuel? What good is, a, is an engine without a battery? Well, Christ is is the battery. He's the fuel. Your body is like this car, but it's, 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 it's dead, it's decaying, it's going nowhere unless it's filled with fuel. You don't go anywhere without a battery. You must have that spark, and God is the spark that's missing in your battery. You've got an amazing car. God has incredible uh, potential for you, 
But all of the spinning your circles and spinning your wheels, sticking in the mud is because you don't have the right fuel. Your car's just not going to go anywhere. So you can use those type of examples to really illustrate your point. That's what Christ did. That's what I do. I've led hundreds of people to Christ. And I'm telling you that probably the number one thing that I use over and over and over again is analogies based on their current circumstances. The other night, uh, when I shared the gospel with this gentleman, I used drugs as an example. He's very familiar with drugs. So I'm using a, a, examples of jail and prison, things that I'm familiar with, that he's familiar with, to make the connection so he can understand that, look, when before you got a, a, indicted, you were already breaking the law of the land. So when, when you broke the law, they indicted you and you were going to go to jail, right? That's exactly how it works. In the same way, when you sin, and sin is just breaking the law, 1 John 3, 4, it's breaking God's law, you're indicted in the spiritual realm and you will end up going to jail. And in Bible terms, that word jail is called hell. It's a place that is eternal torment. It's forever and you are separated from God forever and ever and ever. And I told him, I said, can you imagine being in jail for five years? He said, no, 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 I can't imagine that. I said, well, I have. And I said, can you imagine being in jail for 50 years? How about 500 years? How about 5,000 years or 5 million years? But how about being in jail in darkness forever? Never ending sentence. That's what it's like to be away from God. And that is the that is the. That's the best analogy that I can give. In other words, that's the, a good scenario. It's way worse than even that. Are you willing to take that chance? And so giving the analogies are, are really, really, really critical. How about, uh, and I already mentioned respecting where they're coming from. Uh, there's people from all types of faith, backgrounds, things that they've heard, they've seen. This particular a couple had received a lot of their spiritual training, believe it or not, from television shows like Lucifer and other uh, shows that talk about God and hell and things that, that happen. They don't know any better. They have no spiritual background whatsoever. Uh, and and their, their information that they're getting might be from secularism. It might be from their atheistic mother. It might be from their Baptist background or their Catholic background. You don't know how these people came and, and grew up. So respect where they're at. Uh, never tell people that they're wrong. Just tell them what the Bible says. And the Bible is very good at standing on its own ground. Another really good point that I like to bring up that sometimes my wife has to remind me that I break personally is don't talk too much. And that's really hard for people like me. I love to talk. I love to share his word. But asking questions and taking the pause and taking their pulse is really, really important for dialoguing in the conversation. Remember, most people are very respectful and they don't want to cut you off. They may not be interested at all. It may not be the right moment, the right time. And you might be misinterpreting that they're interested just because they're listening, but they, act, they actually might just be very courteous people. So you want to make sure that you pause, ask questions, ask what, what they're thinking right now, what they're feeling. Do they agree? What are their thoughts? Find out where they're at and check their pulse. You'll be shocked to find out where they're at. Another point is a good evangelist, someone who's a good representation of Christ, doesn't judge them for where they're at. Let, let's say that you're ministering to someone from the, the, from the LGBTQ community. Maybe you're ministering to somebody who, that's of a different faith. Uh, recognize that our job is not to judge them based on what you think about their actions. Our job is to give them the gospel. Our job is to start and engage in a conversation about spiritual things because the end game might not be salvation. It might be just planting a seed. You don't know what your part is, what your role is on their journey. It might be just that you're giving them the opportunity to learn more about God from a different perspective that they might not have learned before. Remember, you don't know what their spiritual condition is until you start asking questions and where they're at. Uh, they might even be a believer that might be just backslidden. And your job is to encourage them and challenge them to come back. God has greater things for you yet. All right, I put this one in here and I, I thought it was, an, it was important, although you probably won't see it on too many websites on, on how to share the gospel. 
I think you need to believe in miracles because it is an absolute necessity that you believe in miracles because it is a miracle that anybody gets saved. It's the biggest miracle there is. The Red Sea doesn't even compare. There's not a single miracle that Moses ever did. Anything in the Old Testament that compares to a life being transformed. That physical human being transforming from death to life is the biggest miracle. You need to believe in miracles. And also, there will be times where you don't lead them to Christ, but maybe you just want to pray for them because they have a broken arm or they have a disease or cancer or something in their body that needs prayer. And it's at that moment you need to be believed. You, you need to believe, excuse me, in the God that you are serving, that you are laying hands on that person. You believe that God can heal them. Be honest about your life. This is really important. Don't hyper-spiritualize what it's like to be a believer, making it sound like it's perfect. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard people, believers, that I know who they are and, and their lives aren't perfect, but when they're sharing Christ, they become Billy Graham. They become this perfect person and they start sharing how the Christian life is the most unbelievable life in the world and nothing ever happens to them and it's always green, but it never rains. Uh, but my grass is always green on my side and, and uh, we don't get sick and we always are rich and have plenty of money. Don't be unrealistic. Uh, just be real. That's what you want to be. Just be real with the other person. And look, man, my life is still full of holes. I st this life is hard. I told this person the other day, the life is hard. And sometimes I do want to quit sometimes, but I've got a king and a God and a counselor and a coach now and, and divine assistance on my side. I have someone that can take the weight of this life off of me at any moment that I'm willing to give it to him where right now you don't. You have no divine assistance. I don't need to ask all about the details of your life. I know that you're hurting. I know that you're carrying guilt and shame. I know that the weight that is on your shoulders is beyond imagination. And when you lay down at night, I know that you're looking up into, that, uh, up into those stars, hoping something somewhere can help you along the way, but you don't know where to go. I'm here to tell you, I know where to go. I know what it looks like, and I know more importantly what He looks like, and I can introduce you to Him. That's how I talk to people when I share Christ. I don't have to, to be, I, I don't beat around the bush. I go right there. I know they're hurting. I know their problem. God says they're broken. I don't care how that smile is on their face, and it was. And they'll be very good at convincing you that life is good, but deep down, I know their soul without Christ is empty, it's hurting, it's suffering, and it's crying out. And you, my friends, are the solution. We are the hands and feet of Christ. Another point that I have on the slide is expect doubts. I love this. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, but with meekness and fear. Some versions say, with gentleness and respect. I love the way this verse starts out. It says, sanctify the Lord God in your own hearts. In other words, before you're, be, you're prepared to give an account to answer people's questions, you need to sanctify God in your own heart. What does that mean, sanctify? To set apart. You need to set Him apart in your heart. In other words, you need to live for God. You need to absolutely be, be known for your relationship with the Creator. Not, you know, learning everything about, about His Word necessarily and the details and all that's great, but what kind of character do you have? What kind of fruit is coming out of your life? Do you exhibit the image of Christ for someone to even want to have Christ? If they were around you, do they know you and do they see Christ? If you don't say anything, if you never share the gospel at work, Will they come and ask you, why are you different? Can you help me? Do, are you putting out a light in the darkness of where you're at? Or would you, you are, are you the person that doesn't share the gospel because you know you've played the hypocrite and you don't have the right to? Well, I can, I, I, got, I got something for you too, because I'm going to challenge you that if you're that person, and most people are, put aside your hypocrisy, make an about face, and begin to make statements with your mouth about your belief system. And yes, in the beginning, they'll be like, oh yeah, well that guy was just cursing a minute ago. But it will keep you accountable to not do it again. 
You see, it's not too late. They still need to hear the gospel. And you can say, you know what? I'll be honest. I, I have been a hypocrite. I've not really lived a, a, a Christ-like life around you guys, but but I am rededicating my life to God and uh, and I'm trying to clean up my life. I'm no different than you guys. I, I, just have, I just have divine assistance. I have a God that I can go to that will forgive my sins. I've dedicated my life, but I've not been very good at it. Just being honest, being humble, being, being open with your fellow uh, man is really important. People respect realism. All right, now let's move into the second half, which is the how-to. We talked about the what we need to know before we do this, and now we want to move into how-to. So how do we share the gospel of Christ? When you are talking to somebody and you feel that leading by the Holy Spirit and you know that that's where it's going to go, I'm going to help you in every form here, every step of the way of how to share God. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one, I call it the break-in. You got to break into that conversation. Somehow, some way, you got to bring God into that conversation. Now, I try to do it by dropping uh, cookies, like uh, cookie crumbs. I'm going to drop hints, and I'm going to put some bait out there, like a fish. I'm going to put some bait out there, see if they take it. And uh, that might be in the form of just saying, hey, man, I just really feel blessed. I'm so God, so glad that God uh, you know, gave us this beautiful day. That's just a simple statement about what I believe that's bait to see how they respond. And if they don't respond, then okay, I'll throw some more bait out there. But eventually, if I really feel like that God wants me to witness to this person, this is what I will say, almost inevitably just like I did the other night when I led this, this gentleman to Christ, I just said this simple statement, this question. So what do you think about God? Do you ever think about God? I've never had anybody respond negatively by asking them that question because I already know the answer. Everyone thinks about God. And so he certainly did. He said, yeah, you know, I do. Every once in a while I do think about God. And, and, uh, and then he tried to rabbit trail and I got to bring him back because people love to get out of places that they feel uncomfortable. Well, I'm about to make you feel more uncomfortable uh, in, in the name of Jesus, right? Because because that's what we're here for. I'm not going to let them lead the conversation. I'm going to lead the conversation. I'm going to gently bring it back because they love to meander away from the topic of God. But I always ask by, by, you know, tell me what you believe about God. And I'll ask them, do you ever wonder what it's like after death? What happens after death? And everybody does. And so it's kind of a it's not an uncomfortable conversation at this point. They, they really do like to, to talk about this in my experience. And so those are good break-ins. Now, from there, there's some key opening questions that I like to ask that really get the ball going. And some of those are, again, what do you think happens after you die? Uh, if you died right now, because after they answer, the, answer that, you're going to know uh, what they believe about heaven, about earth, about about uh, hell, you're going to have a little bit of theological understanding of where they're coming from, which will then bring you to the next question, which is logical, which is, hey, uh, John, like, what happens, like, if you died right now, God forbid, where would you go? And just let that hang for just a moment. Like, wh- where where do you go? And in most people that I have led to Christ, they know they're going to hell. But they will inevitably uh, create the cosmic scale, as I like to call it, where they'll say, you know, I'm, I've been pretty good. I believe in God. And, you know, and this particular person say, well, if I could get sober for six months, if I could be clean for six months, then I think I probably would go to heaven. God, God would, you know, and so then I begin to ex- explain to them, excuse me, the cosmic scale and how that doesn't work. But see, once I know where they're at, then I can begin to go in the next gr- direction. So then I always ask the question, do you mind if I share what the Bible says about that? Because everybody can believe whatever they want to believe, and people can absorb their theology from television, from whatever spiritual background and denomination, but ultimately it's just what God says, right? So I said, can, do you mind if I share what the Bible has to say about that? And I do. And so uh, after that, I like to, uh, to, when I'm training people, to train them, look, there's some key objections that people will almost always come up with, or at least the majority, right off the bat. And, uh, and they'll say, you know, I'm going to heaven because I believe in God. It's important that you know James 2.19. 
So let's read it together because I'm always going to come back with James 2.19. And it says this, even the demons believe in God and they shudder. So there's, in other words, he says, it's great that you believe in God, but even the demons believe in God and, and, and they're scared out of their mind. And I try to explain to this person that believing in God doesn't do anything for you. But intellectual assent doesn't believe anything. And then I, w- I will literally inevitably look for a chair, or in this case, it was, a, it was a park bench. And I said, you know, how do you know that I believe in that park bench? How do you know? He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, how would, how, when I say I believe that bench can hold me up, at what point am I proving that I really believe that that bench can hold me up? He said, well, when you sit in. I said, absolutely. So then I sat in the, in the bench, crossed my legs, very comfortable, leaned back, put my hand on, on the side of the bench. And I said, this is what it means to truly believe in God. But most people just stand up and say, I believe in God and God is the bench, but they never sit in it. So the question I ask is, do they really believe in God? If God requires you to sit in the bench and recline in order to make it into, into the heavens, then if you are standing up saying you believe in God, do you go to heaven? And the, that visual analogy makes the connection in their brain. And they're like, well, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. So I, and so now I've got them thinking, oh man, I, I'm not so sure I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven because my whole belief system is, is skewed based off of works righteousness. And this, of course, is the age-old trick by Satan himself, is if he could get people to believe that they're okay and they just need to do a few more good things to go to heaven, then, uh, then God will let them in. They'll never see the good news. They'll never see the gospel. And they will never transform. So... The next thing that we need to do is we need to show them the problem. And the problem is this. We all have fallen short of God's glory. That, that's the key. You've got to share the problem. Then we're going to share the solution. All right? So first of all, I love to give what I call the hand analogy. And the hand analogy is all about uh, sin keeping you out of heaven. Again, Visual analogies are critical to really illustrating your point because some people are uncomfortable and your words are going right through them, but they will track with you if you use, their, if you use objects. That's what I'm going to do right now. So here's how the, the analogy works. And so I'm going to do it in real time. So Mr. Jones, let me just illustrate to you what it's like Uh, when you're dealing with sin. Because sin, according to the Bible, is transgressing God's law. It's just breaking His law. When you go through a stop sign, it doesn't matter whether you even knew it was there. It doesn't even matter if you're brand new in the United States and you didn't even know what a stop sign was. The police officer doesn't care. You broke the law, you get a ticket, you got to pay for it. That's the issue. There's a law, there's a breaking of it, and there's a penalty. The whole universe operates on that principle. And so I like to illustrate this by using an analogy. So I want you to, uh, to recognize that my left hand, uh, which to, to you is, is on, my, on your right, but on me, it's my left hand. So my left hand represents man and every man that's ever lived from the worst person that you can think of like Hitler to maybe Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, right? Every single man that's ever lived on my left hand. My right hand is going to represent God in heaven, uh, Jesus, and everything about heaven being perfect. All right, so left hand represents man, right hand represents God and heaven. And now, and then you just find anything, a piece of paper, cardboard, it doesn't matter, your cell phone. And uh, and I said, let's let's just let this iPad represent sin. And sin is just transgression of God's law, just like I mentioned earlier multiple times. When you break God's commandments, you've sinned. And listen, I'm telling you, Mr. Smith, if you put your hand in the cookie jar one time, when you were seven years old and your mom told you not to, you sinned. You're done. You can't go into heaven. Do you know why? Because sin is on what? Is it on God or is sin on man? Sin's on man. You're right. So man has a giant problem because he only takes one sin for this iPad to show up and be on me. And when it's on me, it's like the skin on your body. You can't take it off. There's nothing you can do to take it off. So when you die and you stand before God on Judgment Day, we've got a giant problem on our hands, don't we? Because sin separates us from God. This is the problem. 
Mr. Smith, is that there's no way for you to see God. There's no way for God to, uh, to have communion with you because there's this giant, ugly thing called sin in the way. So God saw that problem. He solved it by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in the Hebrew Yeshua, our Messiah, which means salvation. And he took our sin. He took the penalty for our sin. And he died, got rid of that sin from a perfect life so that those that believe on him and believe what he did and take his place as a representative on this earth, when they die, now he doesn't see the sin. He sees relationship. He sees the blood of his son covering the doorposts of their heart and they can have relationship. That's how I share the hand analogy. It really gives a good visual, doesn't it? On how the kingdom principle of salvation works. And then I quote, the Romans wrote is the, where I'm going to, uh, the, the verses that you're going to see now on your screen are the key verses that I use. I don't use a ton of verses. I don't need to. I'm sharing a lot from memory. I'm sharing a lot from my personal life and testimony. And it's not critical to quote the entire Bible from, from end to, to beginning to end. It's important for you to give the problem, give the solution, and let them uh, make the decision. So Romans 3.23 is a critical verse. Would you read it with me? It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I'll just say, John, look, the Bible says everyone has sinned and fallen short. There's nobody out of it that gets out of it. And unfortunately, Romans 6, 23, three chapters later tells us the consequence of that. You went through the stop sign, the policeman po pulled you over, you're indicted, you expect a ticket, and then all of a sudden here's the indictment, and it reads like this, for the wages of that sin or the penalty of breaking his law is death. Why is it death? Because if he lets one sin into heaven, heaven's not perfect anymore. It's not that God doesn't want good people to go to heaven. He can't let anyone in that has ever sinned in their life or it would pollute heaven permanently. And so that's why this is so critical. The problem with mankind is we have the systemic problem is that we are covered in sin, like your body's covered in skin. And we got to get rid of it, but we can't. We can w try to wash it off. We can try to do good things. We can try to go to church. We can try to read our, read our Bibles and help little old ladies across the street, but it will never take the stain off of that skin, off your soul. The only one that can do that is one that is worthy enough to pay your penalty, and that's Christ. And at this point in the conversation is when I give them the courtroom analogy. So let's talk about the courtroom analogy because it's a powerful analogy, especially for people that have gone through the courtroom system. It's very, very uh, powerful. And it goes like this. I'll say, John, imagine that you were, uh, you were in a courtroom. Have you ever been in a courtroom before? And that question is important because it tells me a little bit about their life. Have you ever been in a, before a judge? And I'll say, you know, no, I've never been in a court, but I know what it looks like. Okay, well, imagine you're before a judge, and, and, and you, the judge is about ready to convict you and drop the gavel and give you life in prison without parole. But right before that hammer hits the table, a man comes in from the back doors, opens it up, everyone turns around and looks as he walks up to the bench and says, Your Honor, I am willing to pay the penalty for this man's breaking uh, of the law, if he will accept this, uh, this offer that I, I'm about to give him. And the, the judge says, okay, sure, let's, let's hear what you have to say. So I said, Johnny, can you imagine a guy coming in the back door and saying, I'm willing to take your penalty and die on your behalf. And you say, and he says, all you have to do is believe and accept the fact that I'm, allow, that I'm willing to do this. And you say, of course, I'm willing to do this. And this is where everyone in typical Christianity fails in the gospel is because there's two conditions. One is you got to believe by faith that this man that you've never met before is willing to do that. And you have to be willing to accept that. That's great. But there's another condition that God says. This man said, look, I'm not going to be here now because I'm taking your place. So you're going to have to run my company you're going to have to be the representative of my organization. And my organization is in the soul winning business. My organization is to help people get back to the roots of what I created for them. And, uh, and I need you to take my place. And so, Johnny, you, don't, you not only get out of your death sentence, but by faith, but he's asking you to do something on his behalf 
just for doing that. And, and all you got to do is, is read the instruction manual and follow it and do what it says. And that instruction manual we call the Bible. So, and this is where you explain in the courtroom that the, God is just asking you, real simple, are you willing to trade your death in this life and eternity? And all you got to do is live by faith according to his instruction manual and help him grow his organization. Are you willing to do that? And for that, not only does he, you get out of your death sentence, but you get, you get a brand new shot at life. He takes away all your sin, all the guilt, all the shame, and he replaces it with, with the image of God in your life. Joy, love, joy, and peace, and patience. He begins to work on you from the inside out. You have a personal coach built in. You have a relationship with the Creator. And then on top of all of that, He lets you live for eternity with Him in heaven. It seems like a pretty good deal. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't take it. And then in this analogy is when you will say, what do you think about that? Just take their pulse after these analogies. What are your thoughts about that? Does that make any sense to you? And then I'll share with them Romans 10, 9, and 10. Let's read it together. And by the way, before I read it, it's important for you to know that, that in this hand illustration, I've already told them that the wages of sin is death. I've told them that all men have fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3, 23. And now I've, I've given them the problem. Now I'm telling them the solution. The solution is that man that came in the back door is Christ. And the way that you come to know him is by submitting and surrendering your life and admitting that you've got this systemic cancer in your, in your spiritual soul. You can't get rid of it. And he's the only one that can dispose of it. You must believe that and surrender to that. And this is how you do it. And it leads to Romans 10, 9, and 10. So now let's read it together. That if you confess with your mouth that, that Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And so I explained to them that, look, this is how, how amazing God is. He says, look, I know your heart. And I tell them, if you pray to accept Christ right now, I have no idea if you're sincere. I can't look into your heart, but God does. And he says that if you believe in your heart with everything in you, that, that, that Jesus is Lord, Yeshua is the Messiah, and that God raised him from the dead on the third day, the Bible says when you confess that with your mouth, you will be saved. It's at that moment the devil has no jurisdiction. And I talk a lot about jurisdiction because I understand legal legalities and the law and the court system. And I said, look, it's all jurisdiction, right? If a police officer wants to arrest you in, in, in Illinois and, and you are in Missouri, right? He's got to call Missouri authorities. There's jurisdiction. The United States uh, has no jurisdiction overseas and people from overseas have no jurisdiction over here. They have to communicate to the local authorities that have jurisdiction. And it's no different than, than if you have children, I have no right to come in and discipline your children. I have no authority over them, but you do. So if your wife takes your child out the door to Target, you're never going to call uh, the authorities and say someone kidnapped uh, your, your daughter or your child. But if I come in and take your daughter or your child, I will get charged with kidnapping because I'm no authority. I have no authority or jurisdiction over your child. In the same way, as long as you are on this side of the kingdom and you are under the kingdom of Satan himself, because, and it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, if you're not in the kingdom of God, you are in a different kingdom and he has jurisdiction over you. Once you cross over from death to life, there's no more jurisdiction that the enemy has. You are set free from all the demons of your past, even from your parents' demons and all the things uh, uh, that, that go with that. And you have the opportunity to set the record straight and begin life anew. There's a power and it, that, that transfers when you move from death to life from one jurisdiction to another. And that is the good news. And then I pulse check. Does that make sense to you, John? Tell me if that makes sense. Is there anything that doesn't make sense? Oh, man, that makes perfect sense. I never thought about it like that. A lot of times that's what they'll say. And a lot of times they'll actually begin the process of divergence. And what do I mean by that? They will begin the process of rabbit trailing. Watch out for this because this happens a lot. Uh, people I lead to Christ, they want to move in a different direction and they'll start talking about, yeah, my grandmother, she was a, she was a devout 
believer and she was a Christian and, and she prayed for me all the time. And I used to go over to their house and make, you know, uh, peanut butter and jelly. And we swam in her pool and we fished in her pond and they start moving the conversation. The enemy is scared out of his mind. You have to understand we do not fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers of this present darkness. There are real demonic entities that are listening to this conversation and they are scared out of their mind. They know what's about to happen. So you have to be careful of that and bring the conversation back gently. And then I ask them, is there any reason? When I get to a certain place and I feel the Holy Spirit has done its job, and I've done my job, I'll just ask them, is there any reason why you would not want to accept Christ right now and take care of this once and for all? And I let them answer. Sometimes it's, you know, I, I, I'll do it on my own. Great. Is, do you mind if I pray for you before I leave? I don't even go any further if they say no. I respect where they're at. If they say, yes, uh, I, I, w- I, w- I would like to do that, then I begin the process of explaining to them what this looks like. And so I'll say, look, uh, there's three, there's really three parts to this, okay, that you're going to do. First is you're going to pray a short prayer and you're going to cover that area and you're going to, you're going to ask for a pause. I always ask that God would, would send his spirit to bind uh, and to silence any entities or unclean spirits that would be here that would be upset at this prayer and try to distract, that I pray, God, that you bring uh, kill all distractions and then send your mighty angels wingtip to wingtip, have their so- their fiery swords drawn and ready to create the pause for this young man or, or this woman to come to know you. I pray that every single time. I want to set the stage for their prayer, because I cannot tell you how many times the enemy has tried to disturb these moments in the most bizarre ways uh, that you can imagine. So I do that. The second part is that they're going to repeat the prayer of salvation after you. I have them do that because many times they have no idea what to pray. Sometimes they've never prayed in their life, except for Hail Mary prayers, right, in in bad situations. Uh, So you're going to have them repeat a a, a critical prayer that I'll give you here in just a moment. And then three, they're going to pray out loud after that. Uh, You're going to have them pray out loud whatever's on their heart. Tell them to restate the prayer that they repeated, but from their own heart. And and that will give you a a resonant frequency uh, and a temperature gauge of where they're at, what what, what their heart's feeling. Uh, You'll be shocked at at some of the things that will come out uh, when someone prays. And so that, that's really critical, those, those, three, those three parts in the prayer. All right. And then after they pray, there's a closing statement I always like to do is say, look, if you meant what you believe with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, because you confess this and you believed it, you are now a child of God. Welcome home. And then I normally give them a hug. And so the prayer of salvation is very simple. And you can, you can have them, and, and by the way, tip, pro tip on, on leading somebody to Christ Use short phrases. Don't use a full sentence because they're so nervous sometimes they will forget what you just said. So use short uh, short phrases. So it might go something like this. Dear God, I come before you. Dear God, I come before you. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. And I'm in need of a Savior. And I'm in need of a Savior. I have broken your law. I have broken your law. And I deserve death. I deserve that. See what I'm doing? I'm actually quoting scripture a different way. I invite you to come into my life right now. I invite you to come into my life right now. Would you please forgive me of my sins? Would you please forgive me of my sins? Would you make me a new person? Would you make me a new person? Would you make me a new creation in the name of your son? Name your son. I surrender my mind, will, and emotions. I surrender my mind, will, and emotions. And from this day forward, I commit my life to you. This day forward, I commit my life to you for better or for worse. And I love putting that part in there because it immediately initiates a wedding vow. And and it drops a gravity and a seriousness of what's going on. For better or for worse, amen. And then again, after that, I tell them, look, if you meant what you just said, understand you're a child of God now. You've crossed over from death to life. 
the old things are gone away, welcome home. And then I always ask him this final question, how do you feel right now? And I'm telling you, 99 times out of 100, 99 times out of 100, they will say, I feel lighter, I feel better. And, um, and sometimes you have to deal with healing. Sometimes you have to deal with a trauma that happened in their life. And, uh, and I'll save that for another program because that goes in a little bit deeper. But that is, in a nutshell, uh, exactly what it looks like. Then you have to tell them the next steps. So after they're saved, after you have that moment, that hugging moment, that congratulations moment, tell them, look, this is the beginning of a new life. And I'm not promising that it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, but you've got divine assistance now. And there are some, there are critical things that you need to do in order to foster your relationship with God. Because remember, it's just like getting married. Like marriage is not the altar. Marriage is the beginning, right? The altar is the beginning of marriage. Uh, there are things that you need to do to cultivate that, cultivate that relationship. Number one, the way that we cultivate relationship and grow as a new believer in Christ is through prayer. Uh, in the real world, we call it communication, conversation, talking to one another, right? You can't have a relationship with a spouse if you don't talk to one another. You got to create the space to talk to one another. Praying to God is really critical. And then prayer is just talking to God. And that's what I tell I, There's no special prayer. I talk to God exactly the way I'm talking to you. Number two, reading his instruction manual. I remember John, I talked about the instruction manual. This is your job. You made a commitment. You're going to be a representative and an agent of his kingdom. Then we need to keep his instruction manual and learn it. I encourage you to start uh, in the book of Genesis, or you can start in the book of John. And the book of John is a really good uh, because it's connected to Genesis and it goes through the life of Christ from the very beginning to the very end. So you can get a good grasp on the gospel in real time as Christ lived. And, uh, and then thirdly, get involved with a good community of believers that can keep you accountable, that can encourage you, love on you, help meet your needs, and help you grow. There's nothing more important than these three things. And the third one being very critical, because if you take seed and you put it out on the, on the, the street, it will likely not grow. It needs to be in soil that has the right conditions to grow, and the community is critical for that, that community, uh, that, that soil to be fertile so that your seed will grow. And so I spend the time with them. We talk, uh, in this case, with the gentleman uh, and his fiance that we led to Christ. We bought them Bibles. They're actually arriving today as we speak. We're headed back out there to spend some time with them. Follow up with them. It's really important. Give them your phone number. Follow up with them. See how they're doing. Invite them to your home. Show them what it looks like to have a quiet time, a devotion. Maybe help them find an online devotion. Get them started. Water that, that, that seed a little bit and allow the Spirit of God to begin the process of working in their life. All right, everyone, we've come to the end of today's broadcast. But before we do, I promised you that there is another section to this teaching. And that section is in a separate video. It's a standalone video. And it's how to share your faith in real time. And that video is me training my children through a competition-based thing that I did in my home of teaching them how to share Christ. And then they competed against one another to lead me to Christ. And then me and mom uh, got to judge who was the best person to lead us to Christ. How well did they do? And so if you'd like to learn more about this, like to learn how to do this with your children and your family, or just want to see it in real time, Jim Staley gets saved uh, multiple times in, in a single afternoon, then I encourage you to watch that video. Until then, I'm Jim Staley. I'll see you in the next video.